Well, thank you, Professor Allett, for your warm and generous introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. It's good to see you all. I know some of you have been suffering a little, worrying about your family and friends and properties uh, during these hurricanes. And I know it's a little worrisome, especially for first-year students who are first away from home and worrying about their folks at home. So we think about you. If you need some help from the Emory Student Services, the students among you, seek it out. Don't be brave uh, and suffer through. If you need help, get help. So we're combining two good traditions here today. One, the great tradition of the United States of celebrating Constitution Day. 230 odd years ago, 39 of the American framers signed the United States Constitution and sent it out for ratification. Uh, and every year we celebrate this as a nation. And we celebrate this especially in academic settings. And also this tradition of celebrating great books in the Western and broader global tradition that Emory Williams so loudly celebrated on this campus. Uh, and my assignment from Professor Allett today is to ask the question with you, is the United States Constitution a great book? It's not an easy assignment, and so we'll spend a little time rummaging around together on that assignment, sorting out uh, what we believe as individuals and as a group. The text we're talking about is the U.S. Constitution that was crafted in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, crafted ultimately by 42 framers, 39 of whom signed the instrument. It was sent out for ratification. It was ratified conditional upon it being immediately amended with a Bill of Rights. The first session of Congress created that Bill of Rights, which was ratified in 1791. And this U.S. Constitution and its first 10 amendments in a Bill of Rights has been the law of the land in the United States ever since. And you hold in your hand that said text. Um, is it a great book, is the question. It's certainly an old book. It is the oldest living, continuously operating national constitution in the world. One of the very oldest, although the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution is a little older and also continuous. Um, it is certainly an authoritative book. It commands the obedience and allegiance of every American citizen, if not subject, from the United States president down to the most recently naturalized immigrant. It is an influential book. Some 135 of the 198 countries that comprise the global sphere today have used U.S. constitutional provisions or texts in their own constitutional law. It's a very well-read book. Until 1980, it was second only to the Bible in the number of printings and translations. And now it's fallen a little behind Harry Potter and a few of the other great books that have emerged in the interim, but it's still a highly, highly uh, popular book. And it's also something of a sacred book. Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French commentator on 19th century American life, likened the U.S. Constitution to America's National Bible. And there's something in that. This document sits in a national shrine, properly encased and climate controlled, and is celebrated on great days like this and celebrated in other contexts around the country. It is viewed as an authoritative text in its own right. And every generation is invited uh, to think anew about what its meaning and application might be to particular constitutional questions. And we spend time thinking about not only what the text says, but also what the founding generations say. And we look at the Constitution a little bit like we look at the Torah with its prophets and the gospel with its epistles. And that analogy continues because like ministers in a church or other religious setting, mm, judges in court spend time learning the process of interpreting that text, being confirmed in what they do, making oaths, swearing to the allegiance to that text. And a little bit like mm, ministers who stand on their high pulpits in their black robes and tell their congregants about what it means to love your neighbor or do good unto others, uh, so constitutional judges sit on their high benches in their black robes and pronounce to the world what due process and equal protection of the law means to their neighbors. And so if we're going to judge great books by whether they're old and popular and authoritative and influential and even revered, on that measure, the United States Constitution 
is very much a great book. It may be a great book, but it's probably not a very good book. Good in the sense of, first of all, is looking at this little thing you have in your hand. This is not a book, it's a little booklet. Tiny, seven little articles, 27 little amendments, comprising mm, 7,539 words in total. That's not a book, that's an essay. You smart Emory students can write one of those in an evening. It's not a particularly well-written book, full of clunky prose and all kinds of non sequiturs and aphoristic statements that really go nowhere. It really kind of sits out there, and if you handed it in to Professor Allard or one of your other professors, that you would come back bathed in red ink. Please expand, please contract, please change, please revise. Um, they didn't get it right, even in a short book. It needed to be fixed 27 times by amendments to remove certain odious provisions like provisions respecting slavery in particular and the lack of the suffrage, the right to vote that was foreclosed to large portions of the population from the beginning. So a great book, but perhaps not a good book. And for us to think about that a little bit more, what I'd like to spend a bit of time on is, first of all, where the Constitution came from. Secondly, what's in this text? For some of you, that's new material. For other of you, if it's old hat, please do some shopping. Uh, and then third, a little conversation again about what it means for us as a great book or a potentially great book today. So where does this Constitution come from? And at a certain level of abstraction, uh, the U.S. Constitution and its amendments is in some sense part and product of a long-standing Western tradition of constitution making. All the way back in ancient Greece and Rome and Palestine and Egypt and elsewhere, as we have records, we also have evidences of constitutions, of compacts, of covenants, of treaties, of other organic acts that do something to constitute some things. They constitute a people and often the territory that that people occupy. They constitute power and sovereignty and how it's divided or exercised. They constitute relationships and sometimes even talk about the rights and duties that attach to those relationships. And they constitute um, some values and beliefs, some basics that are held in common uh, by the folk that comprise that duly constituted people. And at that, in that sense, we see constitutions as a commonplace of the Western tradition, and I dare say beyond the Western tradition too. When Aristotle sat down in his politics or in his constitution of Athens, he had about 150 of these little Greek city-state constitutions at his fingertips and speculated about hundreds more that are out there. And as we look at the evolution of the Western tradition in the Roman Empire, the Macedonian and the Roman Empire and the Germanic kingdoms and the medieval churches and states and the emerging political structures of Renaissance and Reformation Europe in the colonial extensions of these Latin powers across the Atlantic, especially, we see constitutions at work. And the U.S. Constitution builds on that tradition rather self-consciously. The founders were big on being classicists. The founders were big on being historians. And especially in the great works of the Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers and the works of leading scholars uh, involved in Constitution making like John Adams and James Wilson and James Madison, Benjamin Franklin and others, a lot of this historical material came to bear. Constitution is creative, but it doesn't create ex nihilo. If we take a narrower compass and we focus on the 25 odd years before and during and after the creation of the Constitution, we get a little more particular picture. And that helps us to understand what goes into that constitutional text ultimately. This is the period uh, before the American Revolution, uh, already in the 1750s. We have 13 independent colonies, each of them with constitutions. And their constitutions are in the form of colonial charters issued principally by the mother country, sometimes supplemented with compacts and covenants. And in 
those colonial charters, we have the usual requirements of constitutionalism. We create a people and a territory, we create power and sovereignty, uh, we create relationships and sometimes rights, and we create basic values that are held in common, the stuff that we always do, and the colonial charters are of the same sort, and they are the constitution of the 13 colonies before there is the United States. And as you know from high school civics, some of you, this is the time when England, the mother country, began to exercise its authority, its power, its sovereignty with greater aggressiveness than was customary or expected by the colonists and began to put in place a number of things that rankled. New taxes for sugar and tea and stamps and other things. New kinds of impositions of criminal procedures, uh, illegal searches and seizures as the colonists saw them, and various kinds of ways of intruding on the sovereignty, the privacy of the individual colonists and their homes and their businesses. We see the creation of new extraordinary courts and institutions like boards of trade and admiralty and, ad and navigation that begin to exercise power beyond what the colonists thought was appropriate. Uh, we see the imposition of a standing army, a British standing army that comes initially to fight the French on the frontier, uh, but eventually becomes the standing army exercised vis-a-vis -vis the colonists themselves and the unrest. And standing armies are always trouble. Uh, they get quartered in your house. They eat all your food. They inevitably consort with your women. They inevitably need more help, and they conscript soldiers from among your population. And they do things that are increasingly viewed as untoward by the colonists. And we see growing, growing involvement by the Anglican Church in the control of the religious freedom of the colonists and impositions by the Anglican authorities on what were considered to be wayward religious expressions. And all those things together eventually drive the colonists to begin to invoke with greater alacrity their constitutional rights in the colonial charters and calling upon the colonial charters to limit the exercise of power that was considered to be ultra vires against the law. And in response, we get back and forth with the British authorities, but by 1766 and 7, finally the British simply throw aside the colonial charters. In a declaratory act, in a series of declaratory acts, simply declare the charters null and void, now leaving the colonists in a raw, unconstituted relationship with the British authorities. And it's that that slowly as these adjutants continue, pushes the colonists to begin to turn to higher authority. And they turn ultimately to what they consider to be the highest authority of their day, the laws of nature and nature's God. And on the strength of that, begin to move toward agitation and then resistance, then revolt, and then revolution against the English crown. And in, on page 35 of the little document that you have, you get one of the consequences of that revolt the issuance of a Declaration of Independence, which is just a lawyer's brief that explains to the world the ground for the authority of resistance and revolt, the laws of nature and nature's God and unalienable rights, and lists all the grievances, the violations against that natural law and the constitutional law before it that the English authorities had gone through. Even as the American revolutionary battles are still going on, the smoke hasn't yet cleared, and the states, the 13 former colonies, now 13 purportedly United States, are in the business of constitution making. Every one of the states between 1776 and 1784 creates a state constitution. Rhode Island and Connecticut simply take their old colonial charter, snip off all the offending royalist provisions, and shazam, they have their constitution. Every other state creates a new state constitution, a few of them several times. And by 1784, every 13, all 13 states have state constitutions. They're important to do the work that constitutions always do. This is our people. This is our territory of Georgia. Nobody else's. This is what we believe, not what those guys believe. These are our authorities. These are our, our, our rights, 
We're not going to be subject to somebody else. The worry was rival states swallowing them up, gathering together and ultimately subduing them. The worry was also a vulnerable post-revolutionary society, which is always ripe for plucking by some foreign entity. It was important not to sit without a constitution. But the problem is, is that the United States were not united. We had 13 fiercely independent states, each with their own state constitutions, engaging in increasing home ruling, protecting their own interests, putting in place their own coinage, giving favoritism to their own citizens and suits with interstate parties, taxing interstate commerce, creating their own alliances with foreign countries, beginning to gather together and create hived off institutions, even possible new colonies and states. And increasing unrest results from this growing independence and rivalry amongst the states, and there's no national government to get it fixed. We had a Continental Congress, the provisional national government that helped guide the revolution from 1774 to 6 when it was called it was enthusiastically embraced by the colonists, active participation, everybody sent in their dues, everybody wanted to cooperate, coordination of effort was critical, but after the immediate exigencies of the war give way to humdrum life as a new nation, the Continental Congress gets weaker and weaker. There's no executive, no president, there is no federal judiciary, and there's no taxing power and therefore no money. And this national government increasingly begins to fritter away. And it's in that context that the new states ultimately choose to try to save the Union by the creation of a new national constitution. We get the impression, of course, from our high school civics books that this was a little bit like a new Sinai or Olympian experience. All the great representatives clattered into Philadelphia as if magi. Nonsense. They were all Eeyores, plodding into Philadelphia hoping to save the Union and not particularly optimistic about it working. There was a lot of skepticism about this project. Unlike all the state constitution making processes which were public and celebrated, newspaper covered and filled with all kinds of enthusiasm, this was done secretly quietly. No records until after Madison's dead and we finally get his notes in 1840 telling us a little bit of what went on. And we have from those notes and we have from post hoc reflections thereafter some sense of the real contingency of this event. Well, that is the event that gives rise ultimately to the creation of this Constitution. So that's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. <coughs> now what's in it? What's this beast called the U.S. Constitution about? Some of you have studied this thing since your third grade. Um, some of you have never seen a Constitution still till Patrick Allett gave you one. Um, and so at the risk of insulting those that are the third grade wonks on constitutionalism, let's take a little look at what this text is. Um, Benjamin Franklin described the U.S. Constitution as a three-layer cake of sovereignty. The bottom layer are the people who are sovereign, popular sovereignty. The middle layer are the individual states who are sovereign and whose sovereignty is duly constituted by their state constitutions. And the top layer of the cake, which has to sit perilously on top of the other two without crushing it, the top layer of the cake is the new national government being created by the people and their representatives in the state, states that now create a body of national authority, national sovereignty. And each of those sovereigns deserves a word or two about what they're getting. Um, the bottom layer of the cake, the popular sovereign, the people themselves, the we the people, which are the folk that start the constitutional text itself and whose representatives sign this beast at the end. Those are the folks that enjoy the fundamental 
responsibilities and rights of citizenship. And it was understood very early on in the Constitution making process that folks have, as a matter of course, a set of what were then called essential rights, fundamental rights, natural rights, and the favored expression, unalienable rights, given to them in their nature, given to them by nature, given to them in the state of nature, given to them by nature's God. That's not important. But the thought was that they were unalienable rights that the people received in their being and which the Constitution was somehow supposed to guarantee. Now, alienation, unalienable and alienable, is a property term. And in the 18th century, when we talked about unalienable rights, we are talking about rights that couldn't be made foreign or alien to you, couldn't be given away, couldn't be taken away. And there's unalienable rights to life and liberty and property and pursuit of happiness, and some of the state constitutions went on and on. But that doesn't make any sense. An unalienable right to life, say. If I take a loaded pistol and go to Professor Allett and I point it at his head and fire, what's going to happen to Professor Allett's unalienable, non-transferable right to life? It's going to expire. And if, God forbid, somebody throws a hand grenade into this room and Professor Allett sees it and sacrificially throws himself on that hand grenade and it explodes, killing him but saving all the rest of us, albeit now with a new dry cleaning problem, right? What's happened to his unalienable right? He's given it away. And so this notion of unalienable or fundamental or essential or natural rights has to be nuanced. And the contractarian philosophy behind this starts talking about the idea of, well, the people from the state of nature in an unorganized society give up a portion of their rights to form an organized society. Uh, and they also give up the rights of life and liberty and property um, in extreme cases that they can be taken away by the state, which enjoys coercive power. But the conditions of their being given or taken away are defined very carefully by what are called due process constraints. Yes, you might lose your life. Yes, you might lose your property. Yes, you might lose your liberty. But here are the conditions on which that can occur. The moral conditions that might guide you and your, de your decisions to deliver, to alienate your property, but also the constitutional conditions under which the coercive power of the state can take them from you. And in some sense, what the rights calculus does in constitution making at the state level and at the federal level is setting those rights, making them clear, defining the conditions under which they can be abridged, infringed, sometimes even taken away. And the US constitutional text, in an unamended form, doesn't do much with rights. We get one big one in Article 1.9 about habeas corpus. Let's have the body. And that goes to the most fundamental aspect of getting the due process that a court will hold out rather than having you incarcerated, your liberty and property and even life taken away without an opportunity to get the basic due process condition. But the, and there's a little more about impairment of contracts and a bit more about ex post facto laws, but not much. It's the Bill of Rights that does a lot of the rights work. And that, which am, gets amended to the Constitution, a couple of years after the ratification of the original powers declarations in the Constitution, that sets out a rich panoply of rights, some of them ancient, simply being reinterpreted and reapplied, some of them drafted and drawn directly from state constitutional bills of rights, some of them distinctive to the US Bill of Rights. And if you go through your Bill of Rights, you've got a bunch of the biggies. What are these? Alien, inalienable rights that are conditioned, well, rights to religion, speech, press, and assembly in amendment number one, rights to arms in amendment number two, no forced quartering of soldiers, that big bugbear issue during the run-up to the revolution in amendment number three, a whole series of 
criminal procedural protections in Amendments 4 through 8. There, the experience of the colonists on the eve of the revolution really informs what the states and what the U.S. Bill of Rights does with respect to criminal procedures. Look, no illegal searches and seizures. Let the privacy of our homes and papers be presumed. You've got to give us some kind of indictment, a written indictment, ideally. Um, you've got to give us the opportunity for bail. If you're going to indict us you're going to have to, on a felony, you're going to have to give us a grand jury of our peers to sit and make deliberations with you so that the people side by side with the officials make judgments about serious stuff. Mm, you're going to have to give us a fair and a speedy trial. You're going to have to give us the opportunity to confront our accusers. You're going to give us the opportunity in the process of this to have a jury trial itself, if we so wish a jury that's impartial and comprised of our peers. Um, you're going to have to, if you decide ultimately to convict us, you're going to have to make sure there's no cruel and unusual punishment that is imposed on us. All those basics, the Constitution spends time laying out in detail, and they comprise the heart of criminal procedural protections in the Constitution still today. Uh, we get other protections of our life and our liberty and our property in Amendment Number 5. You can't take our property. You can't invade it and search it, but you can't take it without just compensation. In civil trials, we want to have an opportunity mm, to have juries and to be tried again by our peers. We want to have basics that are insured to us along the way. And uh, amendments kind of lay out as clearly as they can, with controversy at the edges as to what goes in and what goes out, some waffling about language, like in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. You wish it would have been a little clearer, but we get the picture. The basics are set out there. These are the fundamental rights of the people. Not all of them. And here is one of the glaring issues that the Constitution skates across and nonetheless ensconces. Two folks get sing two groups of people get singled out, and they're not covered. One of them, Native Americans, dashed to the side, and ultimately in Article I, Section 8, how we deal with the Native peoples, that's going to be something Congress does. No basic constitutional rights for you folks, sorry. You're a different folk, and tragically, Congress's policy and the military's policy vis-a-vis -vis Native Americans was tragically prosecuted over the next century and indeed to this day. And the second group that gets singled out uh, and thrice mentioned in the Constitution are slaves. And slaves are principally enslaved African Americans who have come from Africa, come from the Caribbean, or have been born to a slave mother and are now viewed as slaves. They comprise roughly a quarter of the population. Of the 1.6 million odd folk in 1787, there are about 450,000 slaves. By the time we get to 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, there are 15 odd million people, and four million of them are slaves. A big swath of the population. And the Constitution, as we read it in Madison's notes and we hear reflections after the fact, absolutely divided in its formulation on the issue of slavery. And the Constitution ultimately, while never mentioning it directly, um, the Constitution endorses slavery in three different forms. Number one is uh, Article I's power over the slave trade massive pressure by abolitionists to give Congress the power to regulate and ultimately expunge this traffic in human blood and flesh and cargo from Africa and the Caribbean, depositing folks onto these lands and then selling them in slavery. Ultimately, the strike, the compromise struck was we will last on that question until 1808. Congress can't touch it till 1808. 
And in that ensuing period from 1787 to 1808, we had the briskest of the slave trade in the history of civilization or barbarism, as the case might be. Secondly, we have in the so-called three-fifths compromise uh, a insurance of giving southern slave states a disproportionate representation in uh, the Congress uh, this with the so-called three-fifths compromise, which basically says that uh, slaves in slave-holding states uh, don't count as persons. They, alas, are viewed as chattel, their property. You don't count your horses, you don't count your wagons, you don't count your slaves when it comes to representation. But when it comes to representation by your state, your slave-holding state, the Congress, you personally, and then three-fifths of your slaves count. Making a slave, uh, making a slaveholding state like Georgia vastly more powerful in the Congress than a abolitionist state like Pennsylvania. And then third, in Article Four, we get the fugitive slave provisions, which basically says a person who is fleeing to another state and comes into a free state when he or she is enslaved at home must be returned, must be returned by the state and must be returned by any individual citizen within that state. And a person once free in a free state can be brought back home and returned to being a chattel, to be turned to being a beast, to be leased, to be mortgaged, to be used, to be boarded like a beast, to be raped and pillaged and abused by masters and by the master's class with federal impunity. Yes, we have rights for everybody. It turns out that in practice there are two groups that aren't included, and it turns out further in practice that, well, a lot of these rights, especially around suffrage and the like, are not given, of course, to women, to the unproperty, to the indentured, and a few others, and it takes several more amendments uh, about voting to get the suffrage wider, more widely uh, applied across the nation. So that's the first of Benjamin Franklin's layers of sovereignty, the people. Middle layer are the states. The states themselves are already duly constituted by their own state constitutions, absolutely jealous about their identity and power and independence, and grudgingly, out of necessity, coming to the Constitutional Convention knowing that they're going to have to somehow shore up the national unity in order for them as individually as states to survive. But boy, that becomes hard. And we have from Madison's notes and we have from a number of the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers a little sense of all the fighting that went in about states' provisions. It turns out in your little document in front of you, there's not a whole lot in there about states. But it gathered a disproportionate amount of attention during the Constitutional Convention and during the ratification by the people and the states thereafter. What do we get ultimately? Well, we get first of all in Article 4, one of the earliest provisions that gets worked out but even sho shoved way down into the constitutional text in Article 4 is a guarantee to each state as of a Republican form of government. That was highly contested but now it's a guarantee that every state can exist, that the national government is going to be in the business of protecting them, that the states themselves, when they begin to have internal rioting and revolt and yield their Republican identity to something else, that they're going to get help, there's a guarantee there. The states have a few provisions uh, in Article 1, Sections 9 and 10 about interstate compacts, what they can do with each other, some agreements that they can make, little things that ultimately are given to them, and then a generic amendment number 10 that reserves to them all the power that's not expressly given, enumerated and given to the new national government. Again, it's a contractarian delegation doctrine. The people gave up their rights to organize themselves in the society and live within certain limits, called due process limits, and now the states are giving up a portion of their constituted powers to the national government in exchange for guarantees of their basic identity and practice. 
having certain agreements they can make and not make with their neighbors, uh, but everything that's not expressly given and exclusively practiced by the national government is retained by them. And this is the basic federalism provisions that get built into the constitutional text and have seasons of prominence and seasons of decline in the history of American constitutional law. Mm, until the Civil War in the middle of the 19th century, states had most of the power. The new national government is kind of wimpy. In the Civil War and the Reconstruction thereafter and for the next three decades, there's a much stronger national power that subjugates the states, sometimes brutally, uh, over the question of slavery. Um, and then there's a period, 1890 to 1930, through the New Deal, where state power, again, is strong. During the New Deal, during the Cold War, during the run-up to the Second World War in particular, and follow, following wars, especially in Korea, we get a strong, muscular national government again. And then in the last 25, 30 years, in part engineered by the Supreme Court, we get a relaxation. And there's a pendular swing of nationalism and federalism, powerful state rights and powerful national government powers um, that oscillate back and forth. And that season is triggered by different kinds of things, often crises. And then finally, the new national government gets created. And this is where mm, we have the Framers doing a lot of hard work on the legislature, a few dash notes on the executive, eh, and we need a judiciary too, but not a whole lot of specs. Here's the worry. We're creating this new big legislative branch, the most dangerous branch, and the one that the colonists had already worried about vis-a-vis -vis parliament, and that the states are now worrying about vis-a-vis -vis this new national beast. We worry about creating some kind of massive parliament that is ultimately going to subjugate us in our individual states. And so it's important that that national government has very specific ways by which it is constituted, all those clunky provisions about the electoral college and the like, ways that it can operate with a very clear list of enumerated powers in Article I, Section 8, a couple of understood waffle clauses, the necessary and proper clause in particular. You can do all these very specific powers, and then anything necessary and proper to achieve those powers, which is the big wide open door into which pours a lot of constitutional law thereafter. But it's a fairly tightly orchestrated set of rules about what we legislators are given up at the state level so that you national boys can do your work for the sake of the nation. We spend a lot of time on that, in part because that was the real worry point during the federalism, anti-federalism struggles during the Constitutional Convention and in the aftermath. We get the executive branch, and what we have here is a clear, clear, renunciation of royalty, of kingship, of some kind of aristocratic, dynastic class. We don't want to be ruled by those kind of folk. What do we want to be ruled by? Well, we need an executive. There's no understanding of the massive administrative state that we now live with. There's no understanding of executive power being extended to all kinds of agencies through executive orders and the like. There's this notion that we need a prez, a head of the military. We need somebody who can ultimately create uh, laws by signing them into law, notwithstanding the people's efforts. You still have to have the signature. And a few limits on what the prez can do and the vice prez can do, but not much more. And make sure that stays in place. And then judiciary in Article Three. We didn't have one in the Articles of Confederation with the Continental Congress. We don't know how this really works. We need a Supreme Court, a final judicial authority. That we know, and we get a little bit of bells and whistles in Article Three about that. And then, well, what about the rest of the federal courts? Eh, they punt and put it in Article One, Section 8, and say, here, for you, Congress, you create the inferior tribunals. We'll work it out. 
the legislative process thereafter. And a lot of attention, not just saying to the people you have rights that you can claim, not just saying to the states you have powers you can claim, but also a lot of internal checks and balances, restrictions on each of the branches vis-a-vis -vis each other. And this is an old playbook in Western constitutionalism, but the idea that we would put limits on what another branch of government can do is built into the text. And so we do have this collaboration of you create the bill, we'll sign it into law, legislative and executive together. We have the executive veto, we have the legislative override, we have the notion of people being accountable to certain standards of conduct, those basics of our community that we need to have in place. And if you violate them, high crimes and misdemeanors are going to give rise to impeachment processes. And we have at least the seeds of a notion of judicial review, that a judge sitting in her black bathrobe can make a judgment to say that what that other branch of government did is unconstitutional, contrary to the word, the text, the spirit, the meaning of the Constitution, and therefore null and void. And that is the pettiest local magistrate who has federal judicial power can make that judgment with or without the corroboration of the US Supreme Court. All these are designed as checks to make sure that that top layer of the cake stays relatively modest doesn't crush those below, doesn't get out of balance. The thought is to kind of hold it together. Now, that's the text we get. It's a text that is rather ingenious and in what it sews together from the tradition and what it invents to kind of hold the, these traditional and new postulates together. It's ingenious in how it thinks through the economy of expression necessary to make a constitution work. And it's also very much uh, a product of popular deliberation. It's not something foisted on folk. It requires ratification. State constitutions worked in part because they were the Super Bowls of their day. They were carnival time where everybody in the state, as much as possible, law way beyond the bounds of suffrage, election suffrage, way beyond those bounds, the state constitution making was viewed as a popular process, something that people got involved in. Drafts were circulated amongst the folks, published in newspapers, debated in the 18th century equivalent of op-eds. We spent time township by township, village by village, county by county, thinking through provisions and ultimately making suggestions and insisting on ratification by supermajorities before that thing called the Constitution is going to be accepted. That's new. Constitutions used to be simply utterances by the emperor, utterances by the king, utterances by the pope, and shazam, you had your Constitution. Now this is an organic ascending theory of sovereignty, an ascending theory of constitution making, and the founders saw that at the state level and made it also part of the national level. Because the constitution once drafted, the Bill of Rights once drafted, required independent ratification by a supermajority of the states. And in each of those states, each of which maintained their own rules, the same state populist pattern obtained. We have the states, village by village, county by county, newspaper by newspaper, going through the debates about the text. And it comes back, it requires supermajority ratification to become the Constitution of the United States. And Rats and anti-rats, as they were called, people for ratification and against ratification, federalists and anti-federalists, as they were called, debated these things with extraordinary fervor. And that suggests a couple of things about what's the value of this beast today uh, and what lesson we can take. First thing, um, constitutions as civilizational moments for a people. We don't have many of those. 
I mean, Super Bowls, yes. Massive, massive scientific or natural events like the solar eclipse just now or the landing on the moon. Great tragedies, earthquakes, hurricanes and the like, uh, especially when they affect massive populations. Mm, okay, and war. Those are the things that draw nations together. Um, and here we had, in the 18th century, with none of those things yet, the first big occasion, besides the Revolutionary War, to draw the nation together. And a deliberate attempt to put differences, cultural, religious, linguistic, sources of, of origin, uh, places of uh, one's economic interests, to put those aside. And Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Quakers and libertarians and free thinkers who have been slaughtering and slandering each other in centuries past, now coming together in massive constitutional solidarity. Constitutions do credible work, and because of that, uh, they really are, in the American experience, and broader too, uh, really the backbone of democratic governance. And that starts in the creation of the Constitution and it really provides uh, much of the momentum for duly constituted constitutional democracy. Secondly, um, constitutions are the backbones of the rule of law. In centuries past, and in many places of the world today, conflicts, religious, cultural, economic, social, they trigger civil wars massive civil wars. And in the United States, for the most part, they trigger constitutional litigation. We have a place in the United States where we can fight out our deepest differences peacefully, albeit rigorously. And we don't appreciate often enough the luxury, vis-a-vis -vis the tradition and vis-a-vis -vis many parts of the world today, the luxury that we enjoy to have our hardest hardest cultural and other differences worked out by litigation. We don't like it. It doesn't mean we don't have rioting in the streets on occasion. It doesn't mean that we don't have an awful lot of tension around fundamental questions. Think now about race, about same sex, about war. We have fights, but ultimately we work out our fights constitutionally. And every time there's a new government, we have generous and genial succession, rather than wars of roses. And that points out a third thing, and then I'll take a couple questions. I talked about the, the pieces of the Constitution that we say, well, makes it maybe perhaps a great book, but not a good book. But now we may understand why some of those not so good features are there. Why is it so damn clunky? Why can't you just write a nice, clean essay? Why don't you just have a clean pen, single voice, nice, clean, smooth constitution? Because that's not what democracy yields. The point of having everybody involved is you're going to get a text that has an awful lot of compromise, an awful lot of binding together of things that don't always necessarily fit. There's harmonization, there are style committees, but there's only so much you can do to represent all the interests of the other folk. The clunkiness of the prose is one of the virtues of excessive populism, of inclusive populism in its creation. Why is it short? We thought, well, that makes it just an essay. It's a lousy, not like Shakespeare or the Bible or the Quran or something else, great text. No, no, it's a short little 7,500 word text. But that too speaks to the genius of the founders. They understood that they were creating a set of anchor principles that were the start rather than the end of the story. They were creating a constitutional process, putting in place basic principles, occasionally more specific precepts, but leaving much of the constitutional story to subsequent development. They weren't interested in drafting a code. They didn't want to have a 343-page constitution. 
Some folk in the day did, some folk in today still do. But every time the Constitution started getting more detailed, like in Article I, laying out in ever more intricate detail the details of how government should work, the more jeopardized those provisions down the road. Short, laconic, work best, because the Constitution is the start rather than the end of the story. And number three, the founders understood that they were creating what they called a fallible instrument. They understood it was incomplete. They understood it was imperfect. They understood that they were trying to write for the ages but could only write in their own voice, in their own time, in their own age. And so they understood it was necessary to do the 27, now fixes, that that old text now has, been lent, has lent itself to. We pointed that out as maybe that's not a good book. You couldn't even get a little 4,500 words of the Constitution right. It required 3,000 more words of fixes. Well, it was by design. And amendment processes, recognizing that the text needs to be fixed periodically to make it relevant, to remove things that are viewed eventually as odious, to unwork, unmake some of the compromises, especially around slavery, uh, and to refix the text without jeopardizing the whole body of it uh, is one of the genius provisions also built into the Constitution. I've said more than enough, and I know some of you have to go at 5.30, so I will stop and take questions. Thank you. Okay, what you got? Professor Allen says this is the smartest Emory student body he's ever seen. And we give an eminent representative here. Sir. Yeah, so uh, two different answers. Uh, one is about what the Supreme Court could do vis-a-vis -vis what other lower federal courts could do, and the second is judicial review and non-judicial review. Um, the concept of judicial review, starting with the second, the concept of judicial review is known prior to the U.S. Constitution. It was practiced in a few of the states uh, in the 1776 to 1784 period. We have a number of famous formulations of judicial review. Uh, that are discussed in the notes that Madison gives us, but it doesn't get baked into the constitutional text. As Madison describes it, uh, it was not that it was argued against and therefore not included. There was simply a recognition of not knowing how to formulate a doctrine of judicial review. Should it be based upon fundamental principles? Natural law principles say, as we get in Dr. Bonham's case and some of those great 17th century cases? Should it be based on the text of the Constitution itself? Should it be based on the spirit of the Constitution, including the preamble and the Declaration of Independence? We have debate about that. But we don't have dispositive arguments for or against, and what we have is an omission. And judicial review takes until Marbury v. Madison to be formally part of the constitutional process. But Marbury v. Madison, even for a very vulnerable Chief Justice Marshall, uh, is, oh, okay, we're going to do that here too. Because state supreme courts were doing it, state lower courts were doing it, and it was thought to be a natural part of the check and balance system. And certainly the Supreme Court could do judicial review. Was the assumption, tacit at least, and the expectation and immediate practice. The harder question is, is whether duly constituted lower federal courts could engage in judicial review. Judicial review of the very body that created them, the Congress, right? Whether they could extend judicial review to the individual states, whether judicial review had to be prompted by the people bringing an action under a rights claim, or could be prompted by another branch of government seeking to impose the limit on the exercise of power, that was more controversial. At the state level, it was controversial, still, uh, up to 1787. And at the federal level, it took a while to develop. 
and we get a set of cases, Blackburn, Marsh Creek, and that, that set of cases through 1830 before it was understood that, well, of course the lower federal courts can do that too. The Judiciary Act of 1789, created by the first session of Congress, while it's negotiating rights, ducks that question, uh, but it kicks it down the road, and we get a Judiciary Act amendment in 1831 that makes it expressly clear that, yes, the lower federal courts can do this too. But it's a hard question. And as I said, the judiciary is the one that's least developed in the constitutional text. There was an understanding that somehow geezers in black bathrobes sitting on benches had to be in the business of making this constitution real, making it applied in protection of rights and in limitations of powers. That was the whole Achilles heel of the Articles of Confederation. They just didn't quite know how yet. And that question is one that gets kicked down the road and is now uncontroversial, even though for the first 30 years it was controversial. Other questions, comments, quips? That's all? Good Lord, you guys have to have more than that. Please, madam. That's fine. We'll give it a try. Yeah. Um, so this gets to the, it's a very good question. It gets to the heart of a debate that we have in constitutional law from the very beginning about originalism and, for lack of a better term, non-originalism or interpretivism. Is the text itself to be understood and applied in and on its own terms insofar as they can be discerned in the day with the apparatus around of the founders understanding and intent, the ratification conventions understanding and intent, or is the text the start to a constitutional story? That is, inevitably over time, takes on bodies of meaning that go well beyond what the original words themselves said or perhaps even meant, but of necessity become a critical part of creating a constitutional rule of law. And as I alluded to a little bit in my business of constitutional story built on principle, I'm of the interpretivist school that says the text itself inspires a tradition of interpretation and application. And in some sense, for those of you that come from maybe various kinds of religious canon understandings of things. We have a canon, a scripture, and then tradition built upon that scripture, a set of confessions and creeds and canons and codes of conducts and catechisms that each generation builds upon. And the thought is that a textual canonical process inevitably gives rise to a tradition of accumulated wisdom. Uh, and if you add a Wesleyan quadrilateral, since Candler is just around the corner here, it's, it's scripture, tradition, reason, and experience that all side by side form the four corners of the canopy of collected insights that go into being a constitutional democracy. Um, we debate this, though, and here and there, when folk think that federal courts or the United States Supreme Court has betrayed what they understand the original text to mean, or do things that really do seem to be embroidering on the text that goes beyond even its spirit in the day or even over time, there's always the debate about well, reigning in the court. Judges always make law. That's what lawmaking is. It's lawmaking by the three branches of government, and judges do it too. It's not a mechanical process, and there's no betrayal, in my view, of the Constitution when it gets put to the constitution-making process, constitution-making over time in accumulated cases. Because part of constitutional law, part of a rule of law state, is not only to have an anchor text, but to have a doctrine of precedent or stare decisis, a notion that we hold to prior interpretations until those interpretations need to be rethought because of a new issue that's come along. And over time, certain things that have been settled for a long period of time, we don't easily upset. It's not every new day opens that question again. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, if a thing has been practiced by common consent for 200 years, it'll take a very strong case under the Constitution to upset it. And that's true. 
But even that can be changed. See slavery, see women's suffrage, see a few other things. So in my view, back to the original question, I don't think the Constitution is betrayed by a constitutional process of interpretation and application over time. But I recognize, just as we have pendular swings of federalism and anti-federalism, so we have pendular swings of wide interpretivism and then more narrow construction. With the people ultimately given the right, if they don't like it, to change it. And 27 times the amendments have made changes. We're into the time. We have to stop. Please join me in thanking you. Mm. Thank you. All right. Thank you.